Preface and Introductory of The Directory of the Devout Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Marianne Spiegel. The Directory of the Devout Life by F. B. Meyer. Preface. There is too much of mere sentiment and emotion in what goes by the name of religion, and too little practical Christian living. The tree is not good, the inward parts are not thoroughly cleansed, the rule of Christ is not absolutely dominant in speech and life. People are willing enough to accept freely a forgiveness which he purchased by his blood, but they are slow to believe that he is a king whose law must be obeyed in its jots and tittles. We can never allow the great objective facts of Christianity and their attendant doctrines to sink low on our horizon. But we must give equal prominence to the demands of Christ for a righteousness which shall exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees, and a perfection which shall resemble that of God. We have no right to be content with saying, Lord, Lord, we must do the things which he says. In my earliest days I was reared in a school that loved the juicy doctrines of grace, and if a sermon were preached from our pulpit which laid special stress on Christian ethics, during our walk home it would be dismissed as Luther dismissed the general epistle of James, as right stroy, and as savoring too much of the moral essay and too little of the gospel. It seemed as though some of the audience were a little afraid of Christ as a teacher of morals, whilst willing enough to recognize him as Saviour. We understand the matter better now, and have learnt that those who would ascend to the hill of the Lord, and stand in his holy place, must have clean hands and pure hearts, must not lift up their souls to vanity, nor swear deceitfully. Of course, the right kind of obedience is impossible, apart from the cross and the Spirit. We must be reconciled before we can become obedient children. We must be filled with the Spirit before the fragrance of Christ can be manifested through us in every place. The Sermon on the Mount must be read in the transfiguring light which shines backwards from the latter events in our Lord's life. When, however, this is borne in mind, each sentence of that marvellous discourse glistens with celestial radiance and rings with the music of the gospel. In such a spirit let us address ourselves to the study of the Directory of the Devout Life, as it is contained in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. F. B. Mayer Introductory, Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 and 2 Accompanied by his newly acquired disciples, our Lord had traveled throughout Galilee, hastening from place to place, from one synagogue to another. Everywhere he proclaimed the glad tidings of the kingdom, and accompanied the preaching by mighty deeds. He healed the sick and cast out demons, dispelling every form of infirmity and disease which he encountered in his triumphal progress. On the sunlit path of the Prince of Life all the sad results of human sin fled as the wreathed mists of the morning before sunrise. It was a morning without clouds. His fame spread far and near throughout all Syria. The people who— between the exactions of the Pharisees and the hair-splitting of the scribes, were like harried sheep, welcomed his advent with a great outburst of joy. On the one hand, he was so accessible in his sympathy, on the other, so transcendent in his purity and grace. A general impulse of hope and expectation was diffused abroad, and they sought out all who were sick and diseased in mind and body to bring them into his gracious and health-giving presence. In addition to these crowds of sympathizers and friends were groups of curiosity-mongers and sightseers, of inquirers and devout souls, who followed him, with a great expectancy in their hearts, from Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond Jordan. When he saw the crowds increasing thus, he felt that he must withdraw temporarily from their presence. He could not permit the seasons of holy fellowship with his father to be broken in upon even by eager appeals for sympathy and healing. Besides, he had reached a decisive moment in his career when, as his answer to the increasing malice of the leaders of Jerusalem, it became necessary to organize his followers and secure the consolidation and perpetuation of his work. 
a forward step was to be taken, which demanded that he should give himself to prolonged intercessory prayer, so that he might do nothing of himself, but only what he saw his father doing. He was to choose the men whose names, long afterwards, were to be engraven on the foundation stones of the new Jerusalem. He must, therefore, give himself to prayer. The scene of this midnight vigil, and afterwards of the Sermon on the Mount, is an upland rather than a mountain, which rises to about a thousand feet above the level of the sea, and is distinctly marked out from neighboring eminences by the two horns which crown its summit. Let us follow the master's steps, as he ascended by a long and easy slope of unfenced common land, the grass of which was embroidered with daisies, white and red anemones, blue hyacinths, and the yellow-flowered clover, and on which the brown cattle browsed. After a gradual ascent of three or four miles, he reached at length a great crater-like space, with a slightly hollow floor, set in a frame of rough crags, and strewn with boulders and fragments of black basalt, as if they had been rained on the earth in a terrific shower. Dr. Geike. Above, the hill rose up into two high grassy knolls, some sixty feet in height, known as the Horns of Hatton. This is the spot, so tradition says, where the master continued all night in prayer to God. He may have selected for his oratory the summit of one of these grassy knolls, whilst the disciples occupied some lower ridge, and at dawn the people began to gather from the neighboring villages, where they had spent the night, to crowd the vast audience chamber, hollowed out as an amphitheater below. On the southwest, the huge cone of Tabor, to the north, the majestic snow-crowned summit of Hermon, below to the east, the glittering waters of the lake, far away on its other side, the precipitous cliffs of Gadara, rising sheer from its shores, no signs of human habitation, no sound of earthly toil, no fear of intrusion, save from the feathered and furied denizens of air and earth, the free pensioners with the lilies on his father's care. Such was the oratory, whose soft grass was trodden by those blessed feet, or indented by that kneeling form. It was on the mountain, as Luke tells us, that he prayed, Luke chapter 6, verses 12 and 13. As the dawn broke over the hills, he called his disciples from their slumbers, and chose from them twelve, that they might be with him, and that he might send them forth to preach, and to have authority to cast out demons. Mark chapter 3, verses 13 to 15. He then appears to have sat down, after the recognized eastern fashion, opened his mouth, and taught. Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Through paragraph after paragraph, which were to mould the minds of men after a new fashion, and influence the course of coming centuries more powerfully than those of Plato and Aristotle, his speech moved with the transparency and brightness of the river of life, which proceedeth from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Then, descending with his chosen band of apostles, and accompanied by the rest of his disciples, he came down to the level place where the vast congregation was awaiting him, and lifting up his eyes with special tenderness on the inner circle, but in tones audible to the furthest extremities of the crowd, he repeated in a shorter form the marvellous discourse which he had already delivered, Luke chapter 6, verses 17 to 38. This discourse, laying the foundation of the kingdom of heaven, may also be called the directory of the devout life, and we can wish for nothing better than to drink into its spirit and realize its exquisite ideals. Whilst it is, in a literal sense, the Sermon on the Mount, because uttered on one of the great national altars of the world, may it not be called so in the symbolical and metaphorical case? Our Lord was standing on the very summit of spiritual experience. His own soul was fragrant with the Beatitudes which he uttered for his disciples. He possessed in living human experience all that he inculcated. With exquisite naturalness and simplicity, he was describing his own experiences, was revealing the secrets of his deepest nature, and was delineating in colors that can never fade the features of his own face. From the heights he was calling to men in the lowlands of error and sin to summon them to his own standpoint. 
This is emphatically the Sermon of the Mountain Heights. The close similarity and contrast between this sermon and the giving of the law from Sinai has often been discussed, and we need do no more than note the points that have been made. There, the great prophet of the Old Covenant received God's law by the mediation of angels, and his feelings must have been elevated far above their ordinary level. Here, the prophet of the New Covenant utters the revelation of God from the depths of his own heart, from the matured experiences of his own habitual condition. There, the law was accompanied by the roll of thunder and the blinding lightning flash. Here, the accompaniments were soft breezes, the blue canopy of heaven, the lilies, and the birds of the air. There, the law was written on tablets of stone. Here, on the fleshly tablets of the heart. There, the laws were prohibitions. Here, beatitudes. There, the first tables of the law were shattered because of the disobedience of the people, and the second form was equally stern and exacting. Here, out of tender compassion for the weakness of the people, our Lord repeats the sermon with a somewhat slighter texture. Moses constrained to obedience, by pronouncing the disobedient accursed, whilst Christ attracts to loving loyalty by pronouncing the blessedness of the citizens of his kingdom. Men were not to be driven by terror, but attracted by winsomeness and sweet reasonableness. This was the third discourse. The first had been to Nicodemus, the master in Israel, on the necessity of a spiritual union with God. This is the beginning of the devout life. The second had been to the unnamed woman at Sikar's well, on the nature of spiritual worship. This is the nurture of the devout life. The third is on the rule and direction of the healthy and holy soul. This may therefore be called the directory of the devout life. It has been said that there is nothing of the cross or of Pentecost in this discourse, but each of them is required to transform these precepts into living and gracious experience. There must be, for each sinful soul, that forgiveness and cleansing which are possible only through the blood of the cross, or it can never enter through the white gates of pearl into the city of God. For each, too, there must be the inbreathing of the new life, the being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, before that life can be cultured and molded into the developments of which this sermon gives an outline and model. How, asked the disciple in one of old Jacob Beeman's treatises, shall I be able to live so as not to lose the eternal peace amid anxiety and tribulation? To which the master answers, If thou dost once every hour throw thyself by faith beyond all creatures into the abysmal mercy of God, into the sufferings of our Lord, and into the fellowship of his intercession, and yieldest thyself fully and absolutely thereto, thou shalt receive power from above to rule over death and the devil, and to subdue hell and the world under thee. Yes, and we may add, then thou shalt be able to realize the noble ideal which is presented in our Lord's incomparable directory of the devout life, as presented in these chapters. End of Introductory